Uh, but for now, let's get to the star mechanical guest line, Edmonton's number one plumbing and heating company. You can find out more info about all the services they offer at starmechanical.ca. Frank Saravalli, our daily face-off hockey insider, joins the show. Frank, what did you think of Connor versus Connor last night? I thought the Connor Bedard goal in the first few minutes certainly lived up to the hype. I'm still not entirely sure how he got that shot off at that angle with his hands in the position that they were in, let alone doing it at full speed coming up the ice. Very impressive. Uh, short of that, I thought oh, it was a mostly kind of hum-ho mid-December game. Yeah, I, I said off the start of the show, like there are certain things that as we watched Connor McDavid more and more in his NHL career, we were like, ooh, those are like vintage McDavid things or certain little moves or mannerisms that's like, okay, only Connor McDavid can do that. That goal from Bedard kind of felt like one of those, okay, that's going to be his vintage play. That's kind of something only Connor Bedard can do. Yeah, I mean, he's only 12 goals into his NHL career. I, You're not even the first person to refer to that as vintage uh, today. Luke Gazdick also did that on our show, uh, Daily Face Off Live, earlier, and I was kind of taken aback by it. But yes, one of the clear calling cards of Connor Bedard's game is to be able to get shots like that off, under pressure, off the rush, from crazy angles, with nutty hand positions that's really how it that's the best way i can describe it the oilers really clamped down in the final 40 minutes of that hockey game last night and over the course of this eight game winning streak they've beaten some competitive teams they've also beaten a couple of non-competitive teams and when they be beat anaheim 8-2 i looked at that game and i said that didn't impress me a lot because that was just run and gun hockey and the oilers are more skilled and they can get away with playing run and gun against bad teams Last night's win actually did impress me because while the first period was a little bit open, you could tell the Oilers came out in the second and were like, enough of that. They clamped it down and they looked like a team capable of playing not just competent defensive hockey, but like above average defensive hockey. That's a good sign for this group. If they're going to play like they did down the stretch last season, but they're finding that gear in on December 13th, they might they might be a team that's not just talking wild card spot in a few months, Frank. I think that's entirely possible. And I, I think that's been one of the sort of least appreciated parts of the change that's taken place over the last few weeks with this team under Chris Knobloch. And I'm not sure how much of the credit goes to Chris Knobloch. I'm not sure how much of it goes to Paul Coffey. I'm not sure how much of it goes to the players who have clearly put in a more detailed effort. I think watching this team play defensively and give up so little, I think over this eight game winning streak if i'm if my math is correct i i think they've scored they've outscored the opposition 38 to 13 did i see that on jason gregor's feed today 38 13 like you're, you're not giving up very many goals um that and it just they're making the easy play which i think is the a true path to success and long-term sustainable ses success for the oilers throughout their rest of their season is Take what's right in front of you. You don't have to be the hero. You don't have to go out and make a, a crazy flashy play to get the team up the ice. You've got some of the very best players in the world anchoring your forward lines. However ugly or efficiently you need to get them the puck, do it. Um, it doesn't have to be stylish. And I think that part they're figuring out that less is more. And that part, you can talk about McDavid and the run that he's been on and the power play, which gets another goal last night and all these other things, Stuart Skinner playing better. But for me, the attention to detail in their own end has been what's been way more impressive than anything else. Yeah, you mentioned it. Like to only give up whatever it is, 13 goals over an eight game winning streak is wildly impressive. And they've done it by not just rolling out Stuart Skinner every game. Calvin Pickard got a start and gave the Oilers a very good start against New Jersey. I said that was in a weird way, like a pivotal moment because they trusted him with a game that wasn't the Chicago game. It wasn't just back to backs where you're kind of forced into playing him. They legitimately looked and said, we're going to give him a shot here. If that would have gone bad, the talk about Jack Campbell coming back would have been ramped up again. The talk about having to make some sort of a panicky trade in December to address the goaltending, all that would have ramped up. And now we're sitting here going, well, you can trust Pickard with another start here. And maybe if Pickard proves to be a competent NHL backup, maybe the trade conversation dies down entirely. 
yeah, I'm not sure that it'll entirely go away because just look at how the playoffs fared last year. And I there was a real reluctance from Jay Woodcroft and his staff to trust anyone other than Stuart Skinner. And I understand the position that they were in. You're, you're in a must-win spot in the playoffs and you, you just go with the guy that you feel like helped get you there and that can be that guy. This year... And and probably suffice to say, if the Oilers have to turn to a second guy when it comes to the postseason, that their run won't be very long. However, I I think this is not just a two goalie league, but I think this is a three goalie league in that injuries pop up all the time. You're only as good as the insurance that you have. And I think at some point that that position is going to need to be addressed either in a big way or a small way. And I think the more comfortable of a spot you can work yourself into though, if you feel okay with Cal Pickard in net that you can perhaps improve in a small way. That's not going to cost you an arm and a leg that will at least give you some insurance and some safe, uh, you know, some safe safety in net and maybe, uh, your head sleeping soundly on a pillow. If you're GM Ken Holland, I, I just think, they can't afford to go through the rest of the way from now until whenever their playoff run ends without having an upgrade on their second goaltending spot. Fighting Amr says Frank is spot on. And yeah, as you said that, I had the nightmare of, oh my God, knock on wood. What if Stuart Skinner were to get hurt and you're running Pickard Campbell trying to give your playoff upside? Uh, it's a great point. Like injuries can happen whenever. Yeah. I mean, just look at. Uh, injuries can happen all over your lineup. Like yeah. rarely does a team get through a stretch completely healthy and goalie injuries seem to happen as, as much or more than anyone else. So uh, I truly, like I said, I think this is a three goalie league and I'm not saying that just to say it. Um, maybe if Campbell can, f can find some kind of form here that if you feel good with Pickard, that you could at least say, you know what, if things don't work with Pickard, should we have to go with him at some point that we could then turn to Campbell? And maybe that ends up being a great story at some point. But for now, I'd say they have to keep their options open. Yeah, totally. And that's why I think, again, trade talks kind of die down a little bit. We've started speculating about some other areas of their lineup that they could maybe fill. It just it feels good to be back at a point where we're talking about things the Oilers could add ahead of the deadline. And what could they do to make themselves a cup contender? And I'll be honest, Frank, I didn't I like I always felt like some sort of a turnaround would happen, but I thought they would have to scratch and claw their way right up till the end of this thing to get back into the playoffs. I did not have them being back in a playoff spot by points percentage by December 13th like this eight game heater has just been remarkable doesn't surprise me in the least you can roll back the clips yeah. I mean what what day was I on saying you know at some point that this team is going to win eight in a row ten in a row I said it, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see them have a run where they closed out the season this way 14-0 and one last year they're that good they can really outscore all of their mistakes that they make and their their top end talent is really unlike anyone else in the league. So when that begins to click, when McDavid is finally fully healthy again, when he gets that confidence back that somehow the best player in the world seemed to be missing it for a little stretch of time, when it's not Murphy's law, like you can survive a couple of those things going wrong. Some defensive breakdowns, McDavid not being at 100%, Stuart Skinner, not getting you like, but you can't have all of them going wrong at the same time, your power play, not clicking. And that's, that's really what happened to Edmonton. It wasn't like, you know, one or two things. It was a full blown plane crash in the sense that it's not one issue. Typically that sinks a plane. It's five systems failing at once. And that's what happened to the Oilers for the first, you know, 15 games of the year is they couldn't get out of their own way. They were too good, and I think everyone knew they were too good, which is why Ken Holland tried to be as patient as possible to think that this wasn't going to turn itself around. And I don't mean to – that's not taking anything away from or disparaging Chris Knobloch. I think he had a really nice touch with the forward lines last night and the subtle swap that he made uh, when things weren't really going for a stretch of time. But I, I think they probably could have just gotten through it. 
Yeah, I, I kind of agree with you as well. But the one thing that has really been interesting to me, and I was not a fan of the Paul Coffey ad. I was sitting there going, okay, this guy's never really coached at a significant level. Like, why is he coming behind the bench? Why do we think he's some kind of a savior? But then you look like Darnell Nurse is playing like a legit top pairing D-man again. Evan Bouchard has had the mistakes disappear from his game somehow, although it didn't look great on that Padar goal, but who would in that situation? The way Paul Coffey's worked with this blue line too is just another like that. I didn't see that coming. He deserves a huge heap of praise. Yep. And I spent some time with him uh, during the weekend of the heritage classic. First off, he desperately wants to win. And I don't think people in Edmonton fully grasp how big of a role and say he's had in the team on the day-to-day -day basis, really going back a few years now, like he has had the ear of owner Daryl Cates for a while and has been basically the direct line to him. For the last few years and he's around the team a lot he's around the team on road trips he ducks in and out throughout the season goes back and forth between toronto where he lives in edmonton and he so he wants to win one he's committed to and number three he's a top 10 defenseman all time if not top five so when you have someone like that that wants to step in behind the bench, a no-nonsense serial winner, a guy that's been successful at everything he's ever done in his career for the most part, players listen. And I can't help but also think back to, um, on a more personal level, running into Paul Coffey the night before the Heritage Classic. And it was you know, it was at the, the, uh, the hotel downtown, the JW, and who was Paul Coffey sitting there having a drink with? Darnell Nurse's parents. So there's clearly a trust factor, a, a, a level of commitment that Paul Coffey is clearly a big believer in Darnell Nurse and his ability to play and, and get to those spots and be a difference maker for the Oilers. I think it just involves having someone come in that can settle you down, narrow your focus, and help you just, as I said, accomplish what's right in front of you. It doesn't need to be the crazy big play. You don't need to, you could you could score 50 points on this defense by just standing there at times. That's how good the offense is. You don't need to be the guy that's lugging the puck up the ice and making tough plays happen. Just get it up there. And I think that part has has rubbed off on him really well. Uh, let's go outside of Edmonton really quickly here. Um, St. Louis makes a coaching change, even though they have the same number of points as the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, Craig Berube is out, the guy who led them to a Stanley Cup back when he was still the interim head coach. Were you surprised at all that the Blues jumped to make that choice when they did? Yes and no. And I, I guess more so I'm surprised with the timing and where this team is at. Because if you were to, like, if you were to let's say you don't watch the Blues closely and you were to look at this and say, hey, this team's one point out of a playoff spot. Their GM was just on a podcast with you a month ago saying that he knows they're not going to be a playoff team for the next few seasons. Why make a coaching change now? I think a bunch of things had piled up. I think they were disgusted with the teams that the Blues had lost to playing down to their opponents this year, the inconsistency from a night-to-night -night basis. Doug Armstrong acknowledged point blank today. Their compete and work ethic just wasn't there. Their special teams were abysmal. Um, and then I, I think if you take a step back, for me, like I've never really gotten the sense that Craig Berube was Doug Armstrong's guy. That for at varying points since he came on as the interim guy and, and led this team to a Stanley cup and gets a big extension that I kind of just felt like he was looking for an opening, a window to, to change coaches and to change the voice and to change the baseline of this team. I could be totally wrong in that assumption, but that's sort of been the rumblings from behind the scenes, which, which is it's not that they don't get along or don't see eye to eye. It just, he was never really his top choice. He came in as interim, won the Stanley Cup, and then next thing you know, you're just here for five additional years, and that's kind of how it works. Now he has an opportunity to do something a little different. Drew Bannister comes in, interim guy, not even guaranteed to finish the season. They're going to begin a more permanent co uh, coaching search, and we'll see what happens. Um, I don't know that he has super high expectations, in terms of where this team ends up landing. I think there's still some more surgery to be done with their roster. But he said, point blank, we've got to change the accountability 
and work ethic, uh, that has to start beginning with their first game under Bannister tomorrow night. Drew Bannister, former Oiler, as Jay pointed out to me yesterday, and he is a hell of a puck doku answer. If you uh, if you want to go look that up, he played for like six teams in his very short NHL career. Uh, finally, Frank, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit about the changes the NHL announced to the All Star Game, the the skills competition in particular. Last year, we both sat in that arena in Florida during the skills competition, and it was perhaps one of the most boring things I think I've ever sat through in my yes. life. They're changing it this year. They're going to do like a tournament style thing where only 12 players are competing and eventually one single player is going to be crowned the ultimate champion of the skills competition. A million dollars US up for grabs for that player too, which is like legitimate smoke. This isn't like randomly getting a $10,000 check for these guys, which is just pocket change. Like million bucks is legit. I'm actually excited for the all-star game this year. That's like 17 million Canadian. That's awesome. Um, yeah, I think the players and input from Connor McDavid is a big thing. Um, the fact that he sat down with the league, I'm sure there's going to be buy-in on his part to um, to not just help put it together, but also then to participate. And I, I think the players are, are going to like the fact that you kind of keep going as long as you play well. Meaning once you're in as one of the 12 guys, you know you're doing the first six events, all of them. It's not like you do the uh, fastest skater competition, which always seems to be first, and then you sit there on the bench for an hour and a half until your next event, which drove the players crazy. They want to be in the mix. Once your body's warmed up, keep going. The last thing anyone wants to do there is get hurt, pull a muscle, fall, whatever it might be. And so the league's been really lucky on that part that it's never happened. But I think throwing in the million bucks, the fact that players have some skin and some juice on the line, the fact that they had a say in this process, and also really like who's kidding who, the fact that it's in Toronto, it does, it's not lost on me that all these changes are happening right at the time that the league is going to a place where they know there's going to be a lot of eyeballs. You were in Florida with me last year. The All-Star game has moved around to a bunch of different places. It doesn't really generate a lot of juice in the market. But you know that it will in Toronto, and I think they wanted to make sure they put on a show. And we'll be there. We got some exciting coverage planned for All-Star Weekend in Toronto. It should be a lot of fun over uh, with uh, the DFO Live and everything we're doing there. Frank, thanks for hopping on and doing this show today, and we'll chat with you again tomorrow at 10 o'clock Mountain on DFO Live. See you later. What's up, Nation citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube. Podcasts, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it, so hammer that subscribe button.